Central China, um, Dr. Suzanne Sher and Ms. Ali Chang. Um, Dr. Dr. Sher, as a well known Puccini scholar, especially for Manor Lesno, and Mr. Chang, uh, a very well known baritone singer and vocal ped pedagogue in his native country. Um, both from a distinguished 211 project university, which I'm about to mispronounce, uh, Zhengzhou University. Is that anywhere near right? No. No. <laughs> it's Zhangzhou. Zhangzhou. Thank you very much. Zhangzhou University in Central China. So, without more ado, please give your. So we're going to race through this, and we assume that we'll have time this evening to talk more about this. Um, so this is um, training opera singers of the European Western Opera Repertory in Central uh, China, Osea, full body vocal technique, and an international cultural symbol. So. We come from a private university that is sponsored under the public Zhangzhou University. Our private university named uh, SIAS has 26,000 students. We have 600 students in our music department, 180 voice majors, of whom 100 are bel canto, which means that they sing Western opera repertory. Uh, my colleague here is Chang Lei. Uh, I know his last name is Chang and his first name is Lei, but we still call him Chang Lei, not Lei Chang. <laughs> um, he's director of vocal music, so he's uh, technically my boss. He's a wonderful baritone. He graduated from uh, Xi'an Conservatory. He's won several um, first place vocal competitions in Henan province um, and has been directing our vocal music department pretty much since it started. And next month will complete his master's in education in fine arts from Henan University. Um, with a focus on a baritone <coughs> technique in Mozart, Rossini, and Verdi. Um, I have a PhD and an MBA from the University of Chicago, a diploma in singing from an Italian conservatory, and uh, a degree from an Italian language institute. And as he already said, I've uh, been around a long time, written a lot of stuff about Puccini. So that's me. <laughs> We're now going to go into um, giving you just a little bit of background on bel canto singing in China. Uh, we we'll begin with some background uh, on bel canto singing in China. When we sing traditional Chinese opera and art song, there is no need to sing loudly. Traditional instruments do not project in the same way as modern symphony orchestra instruments. So there is not the same need for a full body song in singers. In addition, uh, in traditional Chinese music, instruments follow the singer's melody. They do not sound loudly at the same time. Uh, vocal technique is pushed out from the throat with a high larynx. Uh, to western air, it sounds high, thin, pushed, and less hard. Uh, we typically sing as a soloist or maybe in duet but uh, almost in there in for contrapunto uh, chorus. When make people sing, they sing in a full, uh, they sing in unison. We consider a thin, high sound with much uh, ornamentation to be beautiful. Okay. Many, uh, many Westerners are familiar, familiar with the name Matteo Ricci, an Italian priest and a divisor to the Ming Dynasty Emperor Wan Li around uh, 1600. Uh, Most of Westerners don't know that uh, Western missionaries brought religion Western music. That is a harms and a pipe organ to China in the 17th and 18th centuries. In 1760, the Qing Emperor Hong Li provided uh, Italian missionaries for organizing a band to play Pichini's opera, uh, Chekina, Europe's most popular opera, Buffa, in the 18th century. Yet, even though Chinese nobility were aware of Western music, there was no movement to 
bring Big Gando singing style to China before the late 19th and the early 20th century. In the 88s, 1880s, and 1890s, some Chinese singers studied singing in the conservatory of Europe uh, and uh, America. After the May 4th movement of, of 1919, most of the Chinese singers returned to China from the US, USA, French, Italian, uh, German, and uh, Belgium. They brought with them the sound and the technique of Italian opera. Chinese singers recognize the value of incorporating Italian opera sound and the drama with Chinese singers. See, uh, things they like about Western opera, especially Italian opera, or the dramatic expression which told a story, moving from one emotion to another emotion, occurs a change in characters. The pacing is faster, moving from the element of the story to the next. The musical drive toward uh, cadence in Western music uh, creates a sense of moving forward. This is a contrast with the idealization of Chinese music where each character stay the same throughout, such as uh, all good, all bad, always smart, always stupid. It can be described as a mask uh, which each character wear that does not change. The Chinese find the demanding pacing of Italian opera very interesting and want to incorporate it into our singing. The Chinese singer also liked the bigger, warmer sound of the singers. They wanted to bring back to China the full body support for uh, of Ben Gandal singing because it uh, projects the songs and it uh, supports the full Italian sounding melody. In the Chinese language, one may stop to talk, uh, stop to take a breath between uh, ever two songs. Well, in Italian poetry, a singer must extend the breath over an entire phrase. This requires much greater control of breathing and is a more difficult singing technique. It can be used for singing Western music, but also for enhancing the singing of Chinese music as well. Yeah. Okay. Why did why Belganto in China? Yeah, so why did uh, Belganto singing remain in China for so long until now? The answer is that Chinese singers wanted and still want the strong vocal technique uh, of Belganto singing. And we want to incorporate the dramatic ideas of Western opera into Chinese forms. So now that you understand how Bel Canto and when Bel Canto came to China and why it's still there, our challenge as um, professors at CS College is to teach Bel Canto. So uh, we did our research before coming. The purpose is to identify best practices worldwide mm -hmm. in training opera singers of Western um, opera repertory. Our scope was to compare um, the required curriculums in the United States, Italy, and China. In Italy and China, it truly is mandated by the federal government. In the United States, training opera singers depends on which accreditation uh, committee that you belong to. But in other words, someone tells you what to teach and you need to teach it. So that's what we're comparing, is the mandated curriculum. The, um, the schools that we looked at are in the United States were three very famous conservatories, Juilliard, the Mann School of Music and the Curtis Institute. In terms of universities, which is a totally different sort of training than conservatory training, we looked at the two major state universities, which is the University of California at Los Angeles, which is my alma mater for my bachelor's and master's, and the University of Indiana Bloomington, uh, it should say Bloomington, I put Bloomingdale, sorry. <laughs> where they have 500 singing majors. So that gives you an idea of size. 
And then in Italy, all the conservatories all teach um, the exact same thing. Um, my alma mater is Conservatorio Morlacchi. That's where I got my diploma in Canto. So we, those were the um, curriculums we looked at. In China, the same thing that the conservatories have mandated curriculums, we looked at Xi'an Conservatory, which is Chang Lei's alma mater, and also Wuhan, where some of his students actually attend now. And in terms of the universities, once again, we have that same differentiation between conservatory and university. We looked at Zhengzhou University, which is our school. The methods are we have 15 uh, teaching singers uh, at our school. Three of them teach only traditional Chinese music. The other 12 teach bel canto. So we did both an online survey, survey using monkey survey or something like that uh, way back in December and then more recently in this past month we've done some brainstorming sessions with them. What we asked them is what did you study? Did you study at a conservatory or a university? What classes did you study? What was important to you in your career of the classes that you studied? Of course we all know it depends on the teacher. You can take a great class and have a rotten teacher. You can take a goofy class and have a great teacher. So. That said, still, what is the subject matter that you think is most important? Um, so those were our, that's our purpose, our scope, and our methods of comparing curriculum. What we looked for are differences in the subject matter taught, the number of hours spent in the classroom or in rehearsals, what the singer's professional goals might be, and perceived problems between what their goals are, what the outcomes are, and what the stated curriculum goals are. So the fundamental differences are, there are some really big differences between people who study bel canto in China. Some of them are already performing, just like in the United States, just like in Europe. And so the conservatories tend to be pre-professional training. Um, the universities, uh, we have a couple kids who are really, they're going on to professional careers, but the majority of our students will go on to teach music somehow. The most important thing, however, that I can say worldwide is those university students are creating tomorrow's audiences. They're going to go back into their communities, they're going to promote music and the study, the composition of new music. They're the ones who are going to be the donors or finding donors. They're going to be influencing um, city councils to uh, help support the arts. So we don't want to in any way demote the value of undergraduate training of those who are not going to go on to full-time singing. Um, in, in Italy, as you might know, you don't have to attend any classes. You just have to show up for your ending um, tests. Um, in the United States, you do have to attend. Uh, classes, attendances taken, and you are responsible for the content of both the stated syllabus and what is given in class. In China, you have mandatory hours, and they're really crazy about it. I mean, if you're late, you get marked off as well. However, you're not necessarily responsible for the content. Now, that might seem to a Westerner a little strange. However, there is a, a total focus on group learning. So if the entire class doesn't get it, that's the teacher's fault. And if they all flunk the test, that's the teacher's fault. And that's how it works. So as a teacher, we need to make sure that we're in tune with what this group does. And if I assign them, for instance, that you have to go home and memorize all the words to your song by next week, and they don't come back, it might be because there aren't five of them in the class all learning the same song that they can all practice together. So there's, there's certain cultural mindsets that we have to adjust ourselves to as well. Because of this aversion to um, solo learning, we have a real problem with kids using the practice rooms. And we have, he, he has this whole system set up where you know we check on, you know, you have to check in and out the key to the practice room. And what we figure out is they don't use the practice rooms, but they do learn, but it's usually in their dorms or in one of the parks of the school where as a group they're getting together and they're all going over what it is they have to learn. And because of this, 
they tend to show up at rehearsals without their music learned, so we have very, very long rehearsals, as opposed to in the United States, I know I would not show up at a, a rehearsal without my music completely learned, if not also memorized. So there's huge cultural difference there. Um, also, uh, another thing that I was speaking with some people about this also, here in Asia, when you study Western music in, at a university or conservatory, you're really studying two bodies of music. You're studying your indigenous music. In the case of China, we have huge body of both traditional and contemporary music, and we have Western music. So if you realize it's a double major, and there's no way given the number of hours in each day you could do full justice to both of them, it's going to suffer somewhere. So we have to decide what is our priority. What is it we absolutely have to make sure gets learned? Does it sound like I'm racing? Sorry. <laughs> right. All right, so what we found, what is common to curriculum worldwide is people must learn how to sing. You have to learn to be able to stand up in front of a group of people and make some kind of sound that sounds good to them, to your audience. So singing technique is taught everywhere. The expressive interpretation of a text is taught. Um, soul fetch, meaning the ability to hear, we might call that ear training, and the ability to read music notation is taught everywhere. And also, interestingly, Italian diction, not Italian language, but Italian diction is taught in every school of music that professes to teach bel canto or Western European opera. Notice it's not Italian language, it's not French diction, it's not German diction, it's only Italian diction. Interesting. So what is listed in worldwide curriculum but not necessarily enforced is music theory, form and analysis, music history, and keyboard facility. Now everyone will say that they teach this, but when we get down to brass tacks, I must say that every school has their own emphasis. And this usually is driven by who's teaching the class or who is the department chairman. So this has a wide variation. And what we're going to show you later is that actually music theory, which is what our voice teachers say is one of the most important things that their singers need to learn, is where Chinese students are probably one of the weakest. What is not listed in all curriculum is Western notation. It is taught alongside Chinese notation. Um, and in fact, what we're going to do right now, you can bring those three books. We're going to pass around these books. Uh, Chang Wei is going to bring them down to you. So you can see the, the small yellow books are the books that are given to high school um, music teachers to prepare students to enter the university. And they actually have a combination of Chinese, both traditional and contemporary music, as well as Western art song and Western opera. However, it is all in Chinese notation. So even though we actually have also Western notation, it is very typical that a university student, not a conservatory, but a university student will not be able to read Western notation in any way that's functional. How they learn their music is by going on the internet and they get a recording, that's how they learn. Um, what's interesting is that vocal pedagogy is taught throughout China. It is assumed that if you are a scholar that you teach, it is, it's <coughs> just part of the Chinese way of thinking that if you are a person who is endowed with some kind of knowledge or wisdom, then you also will have a group of disciples whom you teach. Therefore, pedagogy is taught throughout China. It's not necessarily taught in Italy, although um, times are changing and more focus on job-related skills uh, tend to make sometimes things like learning what to do after you get your degree more important. Also, what's not listed in all um, uh, curriculums, and this is a blatant plea, and we even have some gifts as a bride if you uh, respond, is performance practice. We desperately need people to come in and teach. If you use a pochettore in Mozart recitatives, 
how you handle all those little notes, what you do with dynamics in Baroque pieces. This is like, what? If you would say this to anyone who teaches in China, they'd say, what are you talking about, even though they teach Western music? So performance practice is desperate. You want to come, we have a, our school looks like Disneyland. We would treat you really nice. You need a lot of good Chinese food. Come and teach performance practice at our school. We're desperate. I never said that. Okay, I hope I didn't get that report. <laughs> Okay, something else that's not listed in all curriculum are foreign languages. Of course, when you were talking about teaching German, I remember I had to pass a, an exam. As a native English speaker, I passed exams in French, Italian, and German, reading and spoken. Because as a singer, I had to be able to sing these. As a musicologist, I had to be able to read them. However, um, and it, you can substitute sometimes Russian or Spanish, depending on what your research focus is. Um, however, in China, absolutely not. There is just no time to learn a foreign language. As we know, the master of foreign language is a huge issue. So in China, you're expected to, but not demanded, to learn English. And if you do that, that's good enough. And we hope that you have a good coach to help you with whatever foreign language that you teach, or that you sing. Also, something um, that in general is not taught is poetry. The inside of art song and opera, there's beautiful, I mean, who was metastasio, right? There's beautiful poetry. However, that poetry is not examined at all because we don't know what the words mean because we don't study the language anyway. So it's just not there. And if you don't know the poetry or the words, how are you going to talk about the theory of what's beautiful? You can't. In some conservatories, um, some of Chonglei's students are at Wuhan, they do have a class in the study, so I'm not saying it's never taught, but rarely taught. So the priorities are that in Italy, we have um, a focus on Italian opera. Now, I got my degree in Italy. I was allowed to sing in German and French, and I did sing something from the Nazi once in English, but it wasn't smiled upon. We learn in Italy Italian opera, right? And you might learn some Italian art songs as preparation for Italian opera. In the United States, where we're, if you're learning bel canto, you're really learning European opera, um, we, we study all Western repertories. Um, however, in China, uh, if you're studying bel canto, what you really study is Chinese music with some knowledge of Western vocal technique. And you learn that Western vocal technique by learning some arias, but you really are not studying the body of Western, um, the body of Western repertory. So in Italy, um, I was fortunate to do um, both selections and entire operas. That's very typical. Um, in the United States, it's very typical. We'll have opera workshops, so you'll do a lot of scenes, and usually there's at least one major production every year. You'll at least sing in the chorus if you don't get a small part. So coming from the United States or from Europe, you're used to doing productions, right? That's what we do. And any time you would sing only an aria, you know it's within the context of this drama, as opposed to in China, I almost never hear more than an aria. And in fact, it's one of our goals to get our teachers and our students to sing duets so that there's some kind of interaction, some kind of understanding of what the, um, of what the drama is about. Um, about reading notes, in Italy there's a fixed dough. There's also this hand do that you have to do when you do your soul fetch. In the U.S., um, we have both fixed dough. I was taught movable dough. But in China, we have this linear system that is a movable dough. And I'm giving you a picture here of what Amazing Grace looks like. So it is um, the little dots and the little uh, lines underneath have to do with rhythm. They also tell you which octave, whether you go up or down. Um, and that is primarily the, uh, the single line of Chinese notation is what our students come out um, having mastered. Uh, translating the written notes
opposed to actual sound. How do you learn that? In Italy, I know it's taught by your voice teacher, and if you want to pay a coach also outside of the conservatory, you can do that. In the United States, you actually have a lot of classes on personal coaching uh, to help you with interpretation. In China, as I mentioned before, they are almost completely unaware of any performance practice related to Western opera. It's just not taught. They just, the teachers don't know it, so they can't teach it. Um, in general, as we would expect, conservatories offer many more hours of rehearsing, understanding interpretation. Um, in Italy, as I mentioned before, a lot of performance of scenes, same with the United States, a lot of performance of scenes. In China, you do have courses, you know, that this is the, the country of Tai Chi, right? All right, so you have courses on movement and dance, but not necessarily courses on interpretation and on um, stage presence. And that actually is what Chang Lei has me teach. So that's what I get to teach, is stage presence and interpretation. All right, foreign languages. We already mentioned this, so I'm going to skip this. Um, we only teach uh, Italian diction. And this is the biggest problem. They rarely know the meaning of each word. And so I'll coach the teachers. And some of the teachers, as you'll hear, have phenomenal voices. But it's just not important if they pronounce it correctly because they don't know what each word means. So if they say something that's a nonsense word, it's OK because all they're doing is expressing the general idea anyway. Now, there is a problem if you go from China and you want to go to a conservatory in the West and they hear you sing like that, they'll say, what are you saying? You know, why, why are you doing stuff like that? So there's a problem if you leave China, but the bulk of those who learn bell count in China just don't, they know it in a general sense. They're looking at the Chinese um, lyrics. And of course, as you know, if you try to put lyrics to something, you can't do an exact translation. So it's just kind of the general ballpark. Piano accompaniment. In Italy and the USA, um, you are required to be able to cite, read Western notation so that you can accompany something simple like caro mio be, right? Um, in Italy, in China, they have a different system, and we're going to demonstrate for you. In general, they, first of all, most of them cannot read Western notation, definitely can't cite, read at the piano. But what they can do, is the equivalent of if you worked in a piano bar and you heard a melody, you would know kind of which chords to put to it. So we're going to demonstrate for you caro mio ben, and I'm going to actually play the notes so you hear what the chord should be. And then we're going to switch places and Chang Lei is going to play for you what a typical accompaniment would be. So this is what it's supposed to sound like, all right? So, uh, Da Capo Ari 
Claudia, shouldn't she know the form is A, B, A? And I mean, for me, that's kind of foundational because I'm coming from a Western point of view. <coughs> in, in Chinese thinking, things are linear. We don't go back. So the, the whole idea of studying form is fairly foreign. Music history, now I'm a music historian, so this like really strikes down to the heart. No understanding of style periods. We sing French, German, and Italian, Baroque, and Puccini all the same. So challenges for Chinese singers is that we have errors in printed music and recordings. We have an unawareness of performance practices and just a lack of performance opportunities. Um, I've shown you some of the anthologies. Uh, you've seen what the, um, which sorts of things are picked out. Um, what we desperately need, let me show you some errors. This is an example. This is um, In Questa Tomba Oscura by uh, Salieri. Here's what's printed in the score, as opposed to instead of Lascia, we have La Chismi, and instead of Lombre, we have Lembre. Because someone took a photocopy, it's kind of like countless editions, someone took a photocopy, retyped it, and retyped it wrong throughout the entire anthology. And of course, the teachers don't know that, but because I'm fluent in Italian, French, and German, I can go through and say, whoa, 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 this is not right, this is not right. But how many people in China have that kind of facility? That's our, that's our issue. So that's why we would desperately love to swap scores with you. We brought some music. If you want to swap any kind of Western printed or non-Chinese score with us, we desperately need scores that are not printed in China. So please talk to us later about that. Um, the soprano in Mubalu Mascara, her name is Amelia, except in the baritone's great aria where he's talking about who should be punished, whether it's Ricardo or Amelia, he calls her Adelia. Oops. Um, in recorded music, once again, no recognition of performance practices, really big boo-boos in um, just pronunciation of foreign languages. Um, another big example, no ornamentation in da capo arias, or when you have a recitative accompaniment where you have um, and then you have bam, bam, but it's written like this. You're supposed to wait until the singer goes bam, 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 and then you go bam, bam. Well, they play it exactly as it's written, right? They don't do the wait, that sort of thing. Um, at, at the end of Caro Mio Ben, it's written. They're just reproducing what they've heard on recordings. Or for instance, the, the typical thing of there are silent eyes in uh, Italian, or an eye that's supposed to be a ya, yeah, like mi chiamano mi, and still I hear mi chiamano. It's like nails on my word for someone who knows it. Okay, here's another good example of misunderstanding music. Ceres, are, are we out of time? We're out of time. Okay, so let's go to our last slide. Okay, very last slide. What we need to do is uh, we're only looking for the look and sound of bel canto. We're very much isolated from the Western world. What we'd like to do is invite people to come give master classes at our university, use Western media, use um, help us with online translation of whole operas um, and of significant Western scholarly articles. If you have some articles that uh, you'd like to suggest that we could um, have translated into Chinese, especially to help us with performance practice, that would be wonderful. Um, uh, Chang Wei has it set up so that he gives groups to help with uh, teaching kids both how to accompany and how to teach. And uh, we're uh, trying to encourage strongly uses of duets, trios, and ensemble scenes instead of just a single part. And we're trying to build a library of Western schools.